a huge part of my mental well-being is having a strong identified purpose. And I started to feel that that purpose wasn't there. At the same time, I think I had really neglected some of the mental practices that really are important for well-being, meditation being one of them. And that's when I started actually experiencing for the first time in my life, depression. Being so driven at such a young age and starting many companies and then the great roller coaster of Tom's kind of distracted me from really uh, look internal. It really started to question whether my best days were ahead of me or were my best days behind me. And that, I think, can lead to a lot of people to having some mental challenges and feeling depressed. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 363. I'm Jesse Chappis, and I'm here to take your health to the next level. Each week, I'll bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And you may have noticed the opening sounds a little bit different today. As I mentioned, we're on episode 363, and the opening has been the exact same since the beginning. And the reason for this change is that Marnie has officially left the Ultimate Health Podcast. And what she's doing is putting her energy fully into her new show, The Ultimate Baby Podcast, which is excellent, and I highly recommend you go over there, check out her show, and subscribe. And she's also putting her energy into our baby girl, Sorrel. We have a new baby and hence Marnie's new show and we're just pivoting and evolving and you're still going to get a show from me each and every week, an interview with a health and wellness leader. So continue to listen and subscribe to this show and you're going to continue to get great content here as well. And for today's show, I'm speaking with Blake Mykoski. He's a serial entrepreneur, philanthropist and best-selling author, most known for founding Tom Shoes. In the spring of 2020, Blake co-founded his newest company, Made For. And this is a 10-month program that applies the principles of modern neuroscience, psychology, and physiology to make your brain and body better. In his free time, you can find Blake outside enjoying nature, whether it's rock climbing, surfing, or snowboarding. I really enjoyed this conversation with Blake, and it's coming at a really interesting time in his career. As I mentioned in his bio, he's pivoting. Well, he's still focusing on Tom's shoes, but he's got this new company out made for, and his focus now is heavily in the health and wellness space which is super fitting for our show. And he talks about the mental health challenge he experienced, somebody who's had such success and done so many different things. He's open and vulnerable about his own challenge he went through. And we just had a great conversation. Some of the highlights include suffering is the path to inner awareness, the mental health epidemic, the lessons of becoming a dad, the best part about living on a sailboat for six years, and understanding breath work. So much more was covered in this conversation. This is just a small taste of what we get into. You're really going to enjoy it, I'm sure. And if you do, be sure and share it with somebody in your life, a friend, a family member. Share the episode and help us continue to grow. We thank you ahead of time. Without further ado, here we go with Blake Mykoski. Blake, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on. Uh, We got a lot to get into. I want to start with something I came up with in preparing for this interview And came across March earlier this year, you actually went on a solo camping trip in Baja. And this was during the corona quarantine. And I know you were already obviously in a position where you couldn't do a whole lot. But what spurred on this trip? Well, the thing for me was I'd always wanted to do a seven-day silent Vipassana meditation retreat. And uh, being pretty busy as a dad and with work and everything, it's hard to find seven days to go totally off the grid in silence. So I had this date set in March for quite a while. And what was interesting is I started it on March 7th and didn't break the silence till March 15th. And so the whole world changed in that week that I was silent on a island off the coast of Baja. So it was quite a unique experience to come out of silence for a week into all the news about corona and not able to travel anymore. Well, so when you went into the retreat, was this something you did solo and organized yourself or were you doing it with a group? No, I was with a great uh, guy named Mark Coleman and he does this once a year. It's a nature-based Vipassana. So there are about 11 of us. And so when we all came out, you know, we got the news together that kind of the world had changed because of corona. So what did you do next? You can't really travel or do a whole lot. How do you get home or what do you do? No, I couldn't go home. So 
thankfully, uh, my ex-wife and kids could quickly get on a flight when the last flight's available down to Baja. And we ended up staying in Baja for 60 days during quarantine. Wow. So there's a silver lining in the whole quarantine. Yeah, it was beautiful, actually. Okay. So talk about the silence, the period of silence. This was a new experience for you. And obviously, this is something, you know, if you just quickly glance at it, it doesn't seem like necessarily that big of a deal. But when you really stop and think about it, going silent for a whole week, that's a big undertaking. So how did you feel going into it? And then talk about what the experience was actually like. Yeah, I was a little bit nervous going into it, but a few of my friends had done it before and they recommended it. And uh, the experience was amazing. You know, the first day or two was quite challenging, you know, no speaking at all, you know, basically sleeping outside under the stars every night, which is beautiful on just a little mat on this uh, eerily austere island. But after about two days, I really, you know, kind of settled into the silence and into meditating, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. I found it to be just a really, really beautiful experience, brought a lot of clarity on different parts of my life and main transitions that had happened. I would highly recommend it. Beforehand, were you a big meditator? Yeah, I've been doing TM meditating and then also some mindfulness meditation for about five years. Try to meditate for at least 20 minutes a day, usually first thing in the morning. I have kind of a morning ritual I do where I have three cups of tea in silence and then go into the meditation and then usually follow that with some journaling. And so this just kind of strengthened that practice and the resolve at how important that is uh, for my health and well-being. So let's get into that morning routine a little bit deeper. So first thing when you wake up, you have tea? I do. Well, the first thing I do when I wake up is try to drink, uh, you know, uh, a couple of bottles of water. You know, with the Made For program that I've created, we have a very special water bottle that keeps track of how much water you drink throughout the day. And so I like to knock off, you know, one or two bottles to get some hydration going, which I think is so important. But then after that, I go straight into kind of a little tea ceremony that I do. And uh, I try to do that in silence, oftentimes very early before the kids wake up. It's a great, a really great practice. And what kind of tea are you drinking? Depends. Um, you know, I like to drink something, you know, that's kind of like a chai tea, you know, not too much caffeine, but a, a little bit to get the system kind of jump started. I do it with loose leaf and kind of steep it for a while. It's really nice. And then do you get into the coffee later on? You know, it's interesting. I, I sometimes will have coffee now, but not, many days I don't have coffee anymore. I found that like too much caffeine is really not good for my system. If I am craving coffee, I'll oftentimes just drink a decaf. Gotcha. And you mentioned journaling there. What does that practice look like? I know this is something you've been doing ever yeah, since you were 15. Life. So it's something yeah. you've really ingrained into as a habit into your life. So talk about what the current practice looks like. Yeah, I mean, for me, journaling is something that I like to kind of allow to happen very organically. I don't have a very specific prompt. Some mornings that I'll spend some time writing some things that I'm grateful for and then lead into some of the things that I'm excited about for the day. Other times, if I'm going through something, you know, kind of more intense, then I'll, I'll spend some time really kind of fleshing that out. I think a journal is like the best and least expensive therapist on the planet not only because it allows you to really articulate what you're feeling and thinking in the present moment, which is always great just to kind of get it on a page and out of your head. But the most important thing that I have gained from journaling is actually going back and reading them at specific times in my life. So, you know, if I'm going through something that maybe I went through last year or a certain time of the year, going back and kind of reading what I was writing at that time kind of helps give me um, clarity and resolve that if it is a challenging time, I'll get through it as I did the year before as my journal shows. And it really helps me just really just be clear and articulate with my intentions and my thoughts. It must be interesting to go back to 2006 when Tom's got started and look at your thought process at that time and, and what was going on. Yeah, that's been really fun going back with different businesses I've started along the way and kind of see, you know, what my uh, focus was and what was kind of leading to that. But I think that, you know, the best thing about journaling really is, is that you have this immediate benefit from getting the thoughts on the page. But then you also have this repository of, you know, experiences in your life that you can go back to and, and draw strength from. And we haven't talked about food yet or when you eat. So do you ever experiment with intermittent fasting or when do you have your first bite? A hundred percent. Yeah. I do 16 hours a day pretty religiously. And I found it to be incredible. I was listening to one of your other podcasts. I forget 
Panda, Panja, or Sachin Panda. Yes. And uh, everything that he said is pretty much exactly what I do. And how did you first get turned on to that? You know, I don't really know. I, I know I've been doing it for three or four years now. I think just, you know, listening to podcasts or reading articles about it and really seeing that like of all the things that science has kind of shown, you know, fasting, regardless of how you do it, intermittent or, you know, big bouts of fasting throughout the year really just kind of helps everything kind of recalibrate. And for me, my body has just become trained that way. I'm not even hungry until usually 11 every day. And what would you eat at that time? Uh, it depends, you know, on the day, you know, oftentimes I'll just eat what a traditional breakfast would be at 11 and then I'll have my lunch around two or three and then dinner at seven. But, you know, I follow, uh, you know, kind of a paleo, slightly ketogenic diet. You know, I'm not real rigid about it, but, uh, carbs really aren't great for me in terms of my energy level. And so it's usually just healthy fats and proteins and a ton of vegetables. And do you like to get out and exercise before you have that first meal? I don't. I used to like, and it's great if I'm doing some kind of, I would say zone two training. So going for a bike ride or a hike or something, I find it totally fine. But if I'm going to do some, you know, heavy weight training or something that requires a lot of, you know, quick bursts of strength and intensity, then I like to save that for the afternoon once I have food in my system. What about surfing? I know that's a big hobby of yours. Do you ever get out and surf before that first meal? A thousand percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I like to surf first thing in the morning when I'm in an environment where surfing is, uh, you know, I live in Wyoming most of the time, but when I'm on a vacation or where I'm at the beach, yeah, I definitely surf uh, in a fasted state and I find that it works just fine. And I noticed that last year you got into gardening and growing your own food. You posted this on your Instagram and I think you had a picture there with your kids and you're getting them involved at an early age, which is awesome. And gardening has just been such a big part of our lifestyle as well. And every year we tend to learn a little bit more and expand our garden out a little bit more. And I'm just having so much fun with it. I'm just curious how that's changed your whole relationship with food. You know, I think the best thing for that has been just as a teaching experience with my kids. You know, I mean, we don't have a huge garden. You know, we'll, we'll grow some carrots and peas and a bunch of lettuces and some herbs. And it's really just more the experience of learning about how you know, we can grow our own food. So, you know, I try to eat, you know, really healthy and, and get a lot of our food sources from, you know, farmers markets and organic gardens. But in terms of our garden, it's more of the intellectual exercise than like it really providing a lot of our food. And when you go through this morning routine and you do your tea ceremony and your journaling and such, are you doing it alone? Are you creating solo time for yourself just to be with your thoughts at the time? Yeah, that's totally alone. And it's something I really protect. And that's why I really am cautious about how late I stay up because I got to do it early. The kids usually wake up by seven. So I try to, you know, get up around 5.30, 5.45. So I have a full hour for this morning routine and this time alone because it might be the only time alone I get all day long. I know back in 2014, we talked about Tom's. This is when you sold half the company and you made $300 million on the sale. And this gave you a chance to slow down and pause and take a step back and look at your life. I'd just like for you to take us back to that moment and where your health was at at that point. Take us from there through what transpired after that. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a roller coaster of experiences from, let's say, 14, 2014 to 2017. I mean, having, you know, not just financial freedom, but really more time freedom for the first time in my life, because I started as an entrepreneur at age 19, I'd been going pretty hard for quite a bit of time. And the first thing that I really did was, like you said, I slowed down. I didn't have a full calendar every day as I did when building Tom's. And I started taking on a lot of hobbies and I actually got it back into great shape. I was in great shape when I was younger. You know, I played college tennis, but in my entrepreneurial years, you know, you end up, you know, kind of neglecting that, or at least I did. And so, um, you know, got in really great shape, you know, lost some weight, got more active in, in the mountains and, and just started, you know, having you know, kind of physical activity be a huge cornerstone of my day. And that was great, you know, for a while. And then what happened, I found was, you know, say for about a year or two, that was really fantastic. And I was able to just like fully immerse myself in that and just being much more of a full time dad, which I loved. But at, at around six, you know, kind of 2016, I started recognizing that a huge part of my mental well being is having a strong identified purpose. And I started to feel that that purpose wasn't there. At the same time, I think I had, you know, really neglected some of the mental practices that really are important for well-being. 
meditation being one of them, but many others. And that's when I started actually experiencing for the first time in my life, a uh, slight depression. I think that, you know, being so driven um, at such a young age and starting many companies and then the great roller coaster of Tom's, you know, really in a beautiful way kind of distracted me from, you know, kind of having to, you know, really uh, look internal. You know, a lot of my joy and, and happiness came from external accomplishments and external experiences. And then once things started to slow down and I kind of got through those first year or two of doing all the activities I always wanted to do but never had time for. I was then kind of left with this state of like, what's next? And, and it really started to question whether my best days were ahead of me or were my best days behind me. And that, I think, can lead to a lot of people to having some mental challenges. And to me, it, it really led to a state of, of really feeling depressed. And it really was weird because I think the hardest part for me was I was feeling like lack of energy, lack of purpose, uh, a little bit of this just kind of like, you know, questioning, you know, what's ahead of me and not really feeling great about that. And that was really, um, I'm going to say augmented or intensified because I also kind of felt a weird shame around it. I looked at my life and I, you know, had this wife and kids and this great successful business that had helped so many people. And, and I was like, why in the world do I have anything to be depressed about? And so I kind of layered it on with some shame as I've recognized through some real inner work. And that was really challenging. But. You know, I think that, you know, in all the spiritual texts uh, that I've been able to read and experience in my life, you know, almost all of them say that suffering is really a path to God and a path to, to more inner awareness. And I think I had to experience that suffering because that led me on kind of the next great adventure of my life, which ultimately became uh, this new company that I've started called Made For. It's interesting hearing your story it reminds me of a famous Jim Carrey quote, and I'll be paraphrasing it here, but. He says that he wishes everybody could become rich and famous and have everything they have ever wanted so that they could realize that that doesn't bring well-being and happiness. Yes. You're in a similar boat there where you have more money than, you know, you know what to ever do with and and success and accolades and and like you said a wife and and kids and everything's going for you. So I can see where the shame could come in and and how you'd be kind of lost feeling that way. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful quote. And I completely agree with it. And uh, now I'm actually like looking back now, I'm really thankful for that time period because what it really led me to start to seek was really understanding people who are really thriving and reporting, you know, very high levels of well-being, especially from a scientific standpoint, like what are they doing that I wasn't doing? And luckily at that time, I had the ability to connect with some amazing scientists that really study the science of well-being and specifically I met a neuroscientist at Stanford University who has a lab there named Andrew Huberman. And Andrew was really able to help me understand uh, what's happening from a neuroscience perspective when we're kind of living in a state of thriving or flourishing. And I recognized that there were a lot of basic patterns and habits that other people had incorporated into their life that I had not at this point, and that some of these were had some really deep, really sound science behind them on how they can have a positive impact. And the thing that I was most surprised and now thankful for were these weren't like huge biohacking interventions that need to happen. These were basic things that I need to integrate, like, you know, being properly hydrated every day, you know, having a real gratitude practice, really optimizing my sleep. You know, so these were basic things that I had just never had the time or just the knowledge to really integrate into my life in a sustainable way. And so that really led to this amazing kind of year-long journey with another friend of mine named Pat Dossett, who became my business partner in exploring what these habits and practices could do for my day-to-day -day well-being. Earlier, you mentioned going through this time, you ended up bumping up your meditation practice and you've named a bunch of different things that at least over time you took on to improve your health and well-being. But take us back to when you know you hit that rock bottom what are the first things that you took on and what are some of the differences you noticed in how you're feeling? Yeah, I think the biggest, you know, first intervention, if you will, was really understanding sleep and the science of it and how we can properly prepare for a good night's sleep. And then also how we can properly wake up in a way that doesn't spike our cortisol levels. You know, that is one of the months and the practices that we teach and really go deep into in the Made For program. And I would say that was the first thing that really got my attention because once I got that right, I was like, wow, 
I woke up every day feeling so clear, so energetic. And um, it was really something that once I committed to some of the practices that you know science really had demonstrated work, it became a habit and became very easy to sustain. Take us through the before and after. What were you doing for sleep beforehand when it wasn't so great? And then what are some of the things that you began to implement? Sure. I, I'm probably doing things that a lot of listeners currently are doing. I'll, I'll start with in the preparation for sleep. You know, I was definitely drinking too much caffeine later in the day. And I learned about the, you know, the half-life of caffeine is actually 12 hours. So kind of if you're going to bed at nine or 10, like any caffeine after nine, AM is going to have some effect. And so especially it's going to affect me if a three o'clock espresso shot. I got very disciplined in limiting my caffeine later in the day. The other thing that I did was I stopped having my eyes, you know, experience any blue light through screens, you know, kind of within an hour or two hours of going to sleep. I lowered my temperature in my bedroom to 68 degrees where before it was probably 73. And that also made a difference in terms of just getting my body into a state uh, and then also really made sure that I had blackout shades in my bedroom so I could, my mind and my body could not have any connection to light that would trigger it to think that it's still time to be awake. And that was really important for me because especially in the summers in the mountains, you know, it doesn't get dark until 10 o'clock at night. And oftentimes I'm trying to go to bed at 8.30 or 9. And so those are some of the things that I changed, you know, in terms of before I went to sleep. The other thing is, and this is probably, I think, one of the most important things that I changed is I stopped using my phone as an alarm clock and instead got just an old traditional alarm clock. And that helps for two reasons. One, even if you say you're not going to check text messages or emails before you go to bed, which said could cause your mind to start thinking about that versus relaxing into sleep, people who use alarm clocks or use their phones as alarm clocks, they often do that you know, habitually, whether they realize it or not. But the second thing is, is when you wake up, and this is probably the most important thing, is when you wake up to an alarm clock and I don't look at my phone until after my morning ritual, I don't have that opportunity for a text message or email to induce more stress than I need in the morning and raise my cortisol levels. So not only am I sleeping better through the night and falling to sleep faster, when I wake up, I'm having a much more peaceful entrance to the day. And I'm able to stick to that morning routine because I'm not getting distracted by some you know, urgent text. And so those are the things that, that we change. And those are the things that you know, we help you learn through Made For. So for instance, you know, with the Made For program, what we do is we not only give you the science in a very simple, easy to read and understandable way, but we also have designed very specific tools that come in the kit each month that help you learn and sustain this new habit. So with the Made for Sleep Month, we actually send you an alarm clock that we've designed that is really beautiful. And, you know, it's, uh, it's very effective, uh, not just in waking you up. And if you it has a little light, if you need to see what time it is in the middle of the night, that you can click on it without having to once again, look at a phone that could distract you. And then also we provide a beautiful silk eye shade, because some people don't have the ability to have full blackout curtains, or they live in a place where the way that their apartment or their house is designed, light gets in. And so those are two of the tools that month that we have people commit to for the 30 days. And the experience for people is, is really transformative, especially the alarm clock. People just, you know, can't believe what a difference that makes. Where did the name Made For come from? Yeah, so we started working on this program. Um, like I said, we started meeting with the top scientists from Stanford and Harvard and all these universities in the United States, really trying to identify what are the practices that have actually been proven scientifically. That was the big thing. You know, my, my co-founder and partner made for is named Pat Dossett, and he was a Navy SEAL for nine years. And he is very focused on kind of no fluff. And so we really focused only on practices that there was real scientific studies around the country on. And after a year of looking for these different practices, we found that there were only 10 things that we could actually point to science that were worth, you know, sharing or teaching people. And after you know, going through these 10 things, we realized that they really affected you physically, mentally, and I would say either spiritually or purposefully. And as we thought about that, we recognized that we were teaching people not really just what they're made of from a physical perspective, but from a mental and purposeful standpoint, we were helping them answer the question, what am I made for? And the answer could change over time, but without a real clarity about understanding what you're made for, 
it's really hard to sustain long-term positive mental health. Now I'm going to take a quick break from my chat with Blake to give a shout out to my show partner, Beekeepers Naturals. I'm a big fan of the bee elixir brain feel from Beekeepers Naturals. I take it before each interview to keep my mind sharp and on point when talking with the guests. Recently, I gave up caffeine, so I'm happy these are caffeine free and I can still take them before recordings. Bee elixir supports brain health and provides energy and focus. Each box of Bee Elixir contains six vials of brain fuel, which can last anywhere between 6 and 18 uses depending on your specific needs. Here's what they recommend. A third of a vial for daily support and maintenance, half a vial for upgraded performance, and a full vial for peak brain power. I personally always take one full vial, but I'm a pretty extreme person, so you're going to have to test it out on yourself and see what's right for you. As a listener of the show, you get 15% off your Beekeeper's purchase, plus free shipping if you spend $60 or more, by using our link, ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. Give your brain a caffeine-free boost with Bee Elixir from Beekeepers Naturals. Now I'm going to give a shout out to my other show partner, Paleo Valley. My daily supplement stack includes the grass-fed organ complex from Paleo Valley. It's an ancestral superfood blend of beef liver, heart, and kidney. It's 100% grass-fed, non-GMO, it contains no fillers, and it's gluten-free. The ideal way to maintain the fragile nutrients and enzymes found in organ meats is to eat them raw, which isn't ideal for most people. So instead, what Paleo Valley does is they gently freeze-dry the organs in order to preserve as many of these nutrients as possible. This supplement comes in capsules, so it's fast and easy to take, and it provides loads of nutrients without having to taste anything. As a listener of our show, you get 15% off your Paleo Valley purchase, by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash paleo valley. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash paleo valley. Be sure and apply the code ultimate health at checkout to save your 15%. Start incorporating organ meats into your diet on a consistent basis with the grass fed organ complex from Paleo Valley. And now back to my chat with Blake. After growing such a titan of a business, Tom's, and then taking on this new endeavor, how different was the beginning stages between the two businesses? Oh, it's so different and, and so much more fun. I mean, one of the things that I'm incredibly grateful, and this is also a very new experience for me, you know, I started five companies before Made For. And with Made For, it really was less of thinking about starting a business because it was, you know, I went on this personal quest to feel my best and live my best life. And I had the benefit of working with these scientists and learning these practices. and my natural inclination was, oh, I want to share this with the world, you know, and I want to share it in a scalable way that can reach as many people as possible. You know, I also don't need to make any more money, which is a a beautiful place to be in and starting a business. And so I was able to take, you know, two and a half years in fine tuning the program. We had 1300 people go through the beta program so we could really, you know, see the efficacy of it. And then also to launch it in a way where we could really reach people who needed the program the most, the first. And so it's just a different mentality. And so it's really, it's like why I'm so excited to jump on your podcast and while I'm doing, you know, lots of interviews and stuff, because I find that I have such a excitement because I can know how much of a difference it's made in my life and also the 1300 people who went through the beta test. And so now I'm just this like really flowing state of just, you know, helping getting more and more people onboarding with these philosophies and this program without any kind of stress or fear that like we have to do things a certain way because of profitability or this or that. We can really do what's best for our members and we can also grow it in a very organic way. And you mentioned a couple of times there, the fact that you don't have the money stress, which is just fantastic. But what do you think the difference is between somebody like yourself who continues to have drive and continues to want to build businesses, you know, after being financially independent versus somebody who decides to retire and go on a beach and smoke cigars all day long. Like, where does that drive come from in yourself versus, you know, taking option B? Well, I think that drive is a little bit of nature, a little bit of nurture. I think the drive really comes from me about wanting to use my life to help others. You know, that's why I started Tom's and that's really what drives me. It's never been the money. And so I think, you know, maybe, you know, going and sitting on a beach and retiring in that way just would never be in the cards for me because I wouldn't be, you know, living up to my purpose. I really don't know anyone that has uh, made money and retired in that way that has ultimately been happy. 
So I don't even know if that really is an option. I think that's more of a fantasy that the media has created. But for me, I think it really is all around this centering principle of how do I use my life to serve as many people as possible. And you're still a young guy. You're only 43 years old. So you have a lot of years ahead to create a lot of amazing things in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's, I feel so thankful that I, you know, I started my first company when I was 19. So I kind of, you know, jumped into a lot of this when my friends were goofing around and having a great time in their twenties. I was, you know, working really, really hard and, and I was able to build these businesses and get to a state where I could then focus my energy on just continuing. How can I help as many people as possible? And so, you know, I believe this made for journey is the beginning of, of something really profound in our culture and, and addressing so many of the challenges. I mean, I don't think we talk enough about how difficult it is to deal with the challenges of modern living. You know, statistically, there are more people on antidepressants than ever in the history of the world. There are more people taking sleep aids, some type of, you know, either prescriptive or over the counter medication just to go to sleep. There's higher levels of anxiety and stress, especially among young people than ever before. And so I think we really have a, a mental health epidemic on our hands. And I think, you know, something like Made For is, is one of the potential interventions that can help people before they even get to the place where they're still feeling depression and, and needing, you know, some other type of intervention. So for me, it's all about, you know, kind of helping people at whatever stage they are in their life, you know, really shore up these baselines, these fundamentals. And then as we see the efficacy of that, then taking people further along that journey, if they still want to go there. And you talked about the crisis with mental health and the challenges of living in today's world. What do you think that stems from? Do you think it's the always being connected to the internet and social media? And obviously, it's an array of things. But I'm curious your perspective on what you think is at the root of that. I think digital distraction and digital demands is a big part of that. I think the people who create these amazing apps do so with a lot of addictive characteristics. So people do get addictive to these things like an Instagram or Facebook. I also think that because we are always on, our workplaces have become increasingly demanding for you not only to multitask throughout your day, but to always be connected when you're supposed to be relaxing and connecting with your family and nature and other things. And so I think that there's some real costs that society is paying for for all the convenience and technology improvements of the last two decades. Which reminds me of an experiment you did earlier this year, and I'm curious how that went and if you're still doing it, where you took Instagram off your phone. And you I also, did. I think, put a blocker art so you couldn't go on the web and, and load it up that way either. So I think the experiment was for a week. So take us through what that was like and if you're still operating that way. Yes, I am still operating that way. So a week turned into a month and now months have, have passed by. It's been honestly one of the best hacks I've ever done in my life. And I know people who are on Instagram a lot more than me, but I was on it enough. And what I found was every time I was on it, then I was not living in the present moment with my kids or my friends or, you know, whatever. And so taking it off my phone was a really great thing. I kind of look at it this way. I look at Instagram and like connecting with friends and stuff is it's almost like now for me, it's like going to the mailbox. So I have a time of period every day where I do two things. I also took email off my phone too. So now not everyone can do that because of the pressure of their work environment. But if you can, I think that the combo is really powerful. So what I do now is I have either once or twice a day, you know, 30 minutes or an hour, and I go to my office and I just catch up on Instagram and see what friends are doing and share posts and comments, et cetera. And then I'm done. It's like going to the mailbox and then I'll do it the next day or maybe I'll skip a day and do it the next day. It really just made it much more intentional. And I find that I actually enjoy the experience of, say, Instagram much more because it's intentional and it doesn't distract me throughout the day and allows me to live more in this present moment. Yeah, I can't imagine the amount of time you're saving. And there's probably also a feeling of guilt as we're constantly checking our phones and checking our email and Instagram and such, where, you know, there's work to be done. And, and if you're just checking it, you know, on the spur of the moment, whenever you feel like it, there's probably, you know, a bit of a sense of guilt and, and shame over being sucked back into that. And now when you go do it, it's with purpose and with intention so you can fully embrace and enjoy. Yeah, exactly. You nailed it exactly right. Like it's really an enjoyable experience. It's actually entertainment as it should be. I don't know the exact science behind this, but I have read some of the reviews around 
how long it takes you to refocus when you're interrupted by like a notification on your computer screen, an email, a text, an Instagram, you know, kind of experience. And so, you know, for people who are trying to be as most effective during their workday as possible, eliminating those distractions allows you to do your best work. Earlier, you said something that really caught my attention when you're talking about Tom's and how where your best year is already behind you. And that's interesting because you started talking about the new company you made for and how you don't have the financial pressure. But because your previous company was such a success and still is, what's the mental pressure like? You know, you've already grown again, yeah. this gigantic business. And it's like made for is just starting and, and, you know, will it ever be as big or will I ever create anything as big as Tom's? Does that weigh on you mentally? No, it really doesn't. And I would say that actually stems, I think, just from uh, maybe just a, a personality trait. I mean, when I started Tom's, I did not try to start Tom's to turn it into some huge company. I mean, it wasn't even incorporated as a business when I started. We called it the Shoes for Tomorrow Project. So my theory was if I can help these kids in Argentina that I met get the shoes that they needed to go to school, like this would be a really great project. And then I realized, oh, I can help not just those kids, but lots of kids in South America. And then, oh, wow, I can actually help people all over the world. And this is turning into a real business. And so Made for is the same way. Like, you know, we've already helped, uh, you know, I think 2000 people have already been through the program and we've only really been launched since March. We're getting unbelievable testimonials. And, you know, if we help a couple thousand people a year, that'll be a success. And if we help a couple million people a year, that'll be a success. Like, it's really more about the intent of using, you know, my uh, experiences, my life experiences, my personal journey, and all this incredible science that has been kind of locked up in laboratories and getting it out to as many people as possible. And I think, uh, you know, time will tell, the market will tell on how many people we reach. But I really have never been someone that kind of judges success of an intention or project or business based on the size of it. Right. That makes sense. And you touched on the naming there a little bit. And I want to clarify here, obviously, your name isn't Tom, and you said shoes for tomorrow. So get into the naming of Tom's shoes and how that came to be. Yeah. So originally the idea was shoes for tomorrow because we said, you know, if we sell a pair of shoes today, we'll give away a pair of tomorrow. And we were going to call them tomorrow shoes, but tomorrow's was actually too long for the tag on the shoe. So we shortened tomorrow's to Tom's, which, you know, somehow made sense to me at the time, but to everyone else, they just assumed my name was Tom. And, you know, at the airport, I still get people that come up to me and say, Hey, Tom, how's it going? I usually just answer. I don't explain to them. It's a fun little fact that not a lot of people know. Let's get into the story of Tom's a little bit here. We're kind of jumping back. We started with Made For, and now we're going back a little bit. But I mentioned earlier, Tom started in 2006. You mentioned the trip to Argentina. This was actually your second trip to Argentina because you were part of the amazing race. I think it was the second season, and that was your first time being to Argentina. And you guys actually did really well on that show. And, you know, we were very close to coming in first. And, it's interesting to think how your path might have been different if that would have happened. But talk about going back to Argentina a second time. You had a different different motive. You were there to learn polo. Yeah, well, I you know, at that point in my entrepreneurial life, I was working like a crazy crazy person. I mean, I had so much on my plate. And so, once a year I I kind of allowed myself to check out, you know, from the world and go learn something new. And I grew up in Texas riding horses and always was fascinated by polo. I could never really afford to do it in the United States because it's so expensive. But I found a polo camp that was you know, quite affordable in Argentina. So many people play down there. And so, yeah, I went down there to do that and to just get a little break from work. And that's when I discovered the shoe and, uh, and many kids that didn't have them. And that ultimately led to the idea of creating a company where we would sell one and then also give one to a child in need every time we sold one. And like I said, it started out as a small project, but it started to grow pretty rapidly. 2006, 2007, this was a very radical idea back then. Now there's a lot of great companies that give back in a profound way. And it just, you know, took off and we kind of held on. And, you know, as of now, we've given about 96 million children's shoes. So it's reached far more people than I ever, ever dreamed of. That's incredible. And going back to the landscape in 2006, you mentioned how companies now are, are taking on this method of, giving one for selling one, the one for one. Was there anybody doing that at the time when you came up with the idea? No. I mean, that's what's so interesting is like when I told people I was going to do this, everyone, whether it was in the business 
you know, landscape or, or otherwise thought this was like a crazy idea. And a lot of people said, no, you know, business is business, philanthropy is philanthropy, you know, you shouldn't mix them. And, and that just didn't make sense to me. I mean, this was just kind of intuitively, I thought, how great would it be to buy something that you want, you know, that's a desire, but at the same time, actually give something to someone who has a real need. And, um, you know, that was a radical idea then. And in some ways, has really changed the whole landscape of how businesses are, are started and operated both big and small today. And so when I think about kind of the legacy of Tom's, I mean, 96 million children getting shoes and hundreds of thousands of people getting eye surgeries is a beautiful thing. But even more powerful is the you know hundreds, if not thousands of businesses that have emulated the model. At what point was it that you realized you're really onto something? How many years into the business? It actually was very quick, you know, and I think that's kind of sometimes as an entrepreneur, when you know you really have an idea is that almost everyone I told the idea when to buy a pair of shoes and when to be part of it. And the media really picked up on it. We had a big article in the LA Times, we had a big article in Vogue all within the first, you know, six to eight months. We were selling out of our shoes out of my apartment pretty much every week. There's a lot of businesses that, you know, that take some time to get going and grow organically and then kind of pop culturally. This was, you know, kind of like a rocket ship right from the beginning. As it grew and things took off, were you somebody that was able to take a step back and appreciate the success as it was happening? Or were you just so caught up in it that you really couldn't? Yeah, I, I think that we, we did a good job of, you know, really recognizing just what an amazing kind of phenomenon that we were part of. I mean, it really didn't feel like something that we had ownership of, to be truthful. You know, the, so much of Tom's growth and success was because our customers were our biggest evangelists. And they were so excited about this idea of being empowered to help people through a day-to-day purchase. And so I spent so much time on the road speaking and sharing the Tom story and meeting customers. Then also many, many days, you know, in places like Ethiopia and Kenya and Guatemala and even giving in the United States and different areas of depressed incomes. And so I was able to really enjoy the ride. I think the part that suffered, as I said before, was my kind of physical and mental hygiene because I was so enamored with the growth of Tom's and the people that we were helping that I kind of put all my own personal needs on the back burner. And that obviously is what led to the burnout and the depression. But, you know, I really was able to enjoy the ride every step of the way. Even though your health eventually did suffer, were you doing anything? I know you're involved in so many different activities, like, you know, you're an adventurer and you like being outside and hiking and surfing, we mentioned earlier, and golfing. Were you taking time to do those things as Tom's was growing? No, I wasn't. Maybe like once a year for a vacation or something. But that's what I realized. And that's what, you know, I've made a really strong contract with myself as I build made for because it's also growing really rapidly now. And there's a lot of demands on my time to help promote it and to connect with members. But I'm making sure that I, you know, make sure that every week I'm getting outside and going for a mountain bike or if I'm somewhere where there's surf, you know, getting surf and, and whatnot. So that's something that I'm definitely doing differently this time around. And how did having kids change your whole entrepreneurial journey? Where were you at? What year was that when you had your first child? And how did it change things? 2014 is when we had our son. And, you know, I think the best thing is I realized that everything I learned as an entrepreneur was like really applicable to becoming a dad. And then the more that I leaned into the lessons of becoming a dad, they really helped me be a better leader and business person. It was a very symbiotic relationship. And, and I'm incredibly grateful that you know, that I've had the privilege of having now two kids. And I also have a 24 year old adopted Ethiopian son, which has been just one of the great joys of my life. And so it's a beautiful thing. And when you stay open to seeing how those lessons can go back and forth. And early on in the interview, you mentioned gratitude. And I'm just curious, how do you go about fitting that into your life as a habit day to day? Yeah, it's one thing that we actually spend a whole month focusing on actually the science of gratitude. There's been incredible research done Marty Siegelman has done a lot of that and many other great professors and scientists around the country. You know, I think that the simplest thing is really trying to, you know, be able to identify three things that you're grateful every day. But what we realize is that's like brushing your teeth. When you really can benefit some of the powers of gratitude is when you learn how to look at, say, challenging situations during your life in the past, things that seem tragic or, you know, really challenging or real big setbacks. But then to look at those later, years later, and see, oh, well, those, I had to have that setback or I had to have that challenge in order for me to go down this path, which has brought me so much joy. And so one of the exercises that we do with Made For is we really help you from a neuroscientist rewire your brain 
on how you look at adversity and challenging situations because you know that in the past those challenging situations have actually benefited you greatly. Um, we have some different practices too long to go into here that we take you through in the month that really reframes the way that you have gratitude to all circumstances, not just the things that seem pleasant. And when it comes to gratitude, do you feel like you have to actually write it down to benefit from it? Or are you somebody that has, you know, just different triggers throughout the day and you kind of go over that in your own head? Yeah. I mean, for me as an avid journaler, writing is a really beautiful way to do it. But a lot of people do it through prayer. A lot of people do it in, you know, meditation. A lot of people, you know, just find ways to express it to those that they're grateful for and, you know, consistently through a handwritten note or an email or a text. So I don't think there's a, a way you have to do it, but I do think it's important that you express it in some external way. Now I'm going to take another quick break from my chat with Blake to give a shout out to my show partner, Sun Warrior. We always make sure and have some Sun Warrior Warrior Blend protein on hand. It mixes well into smoothies or it can be blended with your favorite nut milk and poured over a healthy cereal. It comes in five flavors, berry, chocolate, mocha, natural, and vanilla. We stick with vanilla because it has a great taste and mixes well with anything. The Warrior Blend protein is organic, grain-free, vegan, soy-free, and it's keto and paleo-friendly. And as the listener of our show, you get 20% off your Sun Warrior purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. On top of that, if you spend $50 or more, you get free shipping. Give your smoothies a boost by adding in some Sun Warrior Warrior Blend protein. Now I'm going to give a shout out to my other show partner, Organifi. The Organifi green juice is filled with immune boosting superfoods. It's organic, gluten-free, soy-free, vegan, and keto-friendly. The ingredients include moringa, chlorella, mint, spirulina, beets, matcha green tea, wheatgrass, ashwagandha, and turmeric. All you need to do is add a scoop of this to some clean water, give it a shake or stir, and it's ready to drink. And as a listener of TUHP, you get 20% off your Organifi purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Add more superfoods to your daily routine with the green juice from Organifi. And now back to my chat with Blake. And one of the other months is connection. So... I'm assuming this is spending quality time with family and friends and making that a priority. How do you go about doing that in your own life? Yeah, so it is about family and friends, um, but it's also about, you know, strangers. One of the incredible pieces of science we found was just the benefit of smiling and looking in the eyes of the first three people you see during the day, whether you know them or not. There's something that it literally triggers chemically in your brain when you create that human connection. And so That is, you know, just part of a practice, but then there are other practices that we get into in the made for month on how you can strengthen the connection with your loved ones and your friends and how important that is. I mean, you know, one of my favorite books and and things that I've researched over the years is like the parts of the world where people live the longest, the centurions. And these are called blue zones. And if you've read the blue zone book, it, it really is specific around you know, whether one of the blue zones is in Japan and one of the blue zones is, say, in Costa Rica. But one of the things that all those people share is they have a real sense of community and a lot of human connection in meaningful ways. And so this isn't just so you'll feel good today. This is actually increasing your physical health from a longevity standpoint is too. And that's what I love so much about what we learned when building the Made For program is that these are not just practices and habits that will increase your day-to-day well-being and help you be more resilient against the challenges of modern living, these are things that are also going to help you live a lot longer. And you mentioned the blue zones there. We've actually had the author of the book, Dan Butner, on the show in the yeah. past, and I love his work too. Yeah, he's great. So when it comes to making time for family and friends as a busy entrepreneur, is this something you take time and actually put in your calendar and schedule to make sure it happens? Because I'm busy myself with work and and I have a lot going on each and every day, but I'm guessing you're the same where weeks just go by and it's so easy to get caught up in work and, and things right in front of you. But to make sure you're spending time with those other people, how do you go about doing that on a regular basis? Absolutely. You nailed it. You know, if it doesn't get scheduled, it doesn't get done. If you live a very busy 
you know, life or have a demanding job or entrepreneurial venture, you know, and so I absolutely am scheduling that time with my kids, my friends, you know, my alone time in the morning. That's a critical step to making sure that you don't lose sight of that when things get hectic. And another one of the months is nature. And this brings me to a story I want to get into of you earlier on living on a boat. So at what point in your journey was this? And talk about what kind of boat was this? Yeah, so uh, it was right when I started Tom's. We were running Tom's out of my apartment. And when we decided to move into a warehouse down the road, which would be, quote, our first real office, I realized I didn't need this big apartment anymore because I was mainly working or on airplanes. And at the same time, I really recognized that when I wasn't working, I needed to maximize the quality of my downtime. And I loved always being near the water, but I couldn't afford to have a home or an apartment near the water in Los Angeles. So I heard that you could actually rent a slip in the marina. And I researched the cost of you know sailboats and it was a lot cheaper than an apartment. And so Without even knowing how to sail, I bought a 35 foot sailboat and I uh, got a slip. And then I learned to sail, which was a great, you know, kind of new growth mindset experience for me. But the best part about living on the boat wasn't even really sailing. It was just actually living on it, you know, like waking up in the morning, hearing the birds, seeing the still waters, having my coffee on the back of the boat. And also one of the best things about living on the boat was you could have virtually zero stuff. So I had to really get rid of all the material possessions that really weren't absolutely critical in providing me with a ton of joy and uh, live much simpler. I lived on the boat for six years. I had no other home besides that. It was very close to the airport, so that was convenient. And I still look back at those years as some of my best years. And when I take vacations now, I oftentimes will uh, rent a boat and just kind of check out and be on the water. That sounds like a lot of fun. And were you single at the time? I was. It was a it was a great way to live singly, uh, you know. And then when I did meet my girlfriend, who became my wife, you know, she lived on the boat for a little bit. But then once we got married, we moved into a house. Gotcha. And you mentioned, you know, being forced to get rid of stuff and living more minimalistically. Is that something you've carried forward? Even though now, obviously, you have a house and you're not living that lifestyle. But what are some of the principles from that time that you've carried forward into living today? Yeah, interestingly enough, that actually popped up when we were doing all of our research for Made For. So there's a lot of science around this concept of essentialism and also how your physical environment affects your mental health. And when you have stuff in your physical environment that you're not using or that does not really provide you joy, but it's just accumulated over the years, that can really drain your energy. And so one of the months we really focus on decluttering not only your stuff, but even your social calendar or you know, your work calendar meetings that you don't necessarily need to be in, uh, et cetera. And so that kind of popped back up and it, it gave me a, a nice smile because I was like, wow, like I intuitively did that when I was, you know, 29, 30 years old. And even with a house and kids and a lot of quote stuff now, you can find ways to do it that kind of optimizes your, your living or your work environment. And that's one of the months that we get incredible feedback from people on. And that they kind of intuitively have always known it. They just never had the courage to actually do it, or they haven't had the steps or the science to back it up to give them the conviction to do it. And so that's um, one of the months that we focus on as well. Greg McEwen, the author of Essentialism, is also a previous guest of the show. And Oh, yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's awesome. And And it's interesting, when I look back at a lot of the more recent interviews, I've done a lot of interviews with people that are that are focusing on living simply and minimalistically and and it's just something in my own life I've found great benefit from, you know, not becoming super extreme and getting rid of everything. I'm a new dad and I'm finding out that being a dad and having a young kid, there's a lot of stuff that comes with it. And I'm married and obviously there's, we have our, our home and we have stuff, but when I can go and get rid of things that are just sitting there and not providing any value, it's, it's just so freeing. It's hard to really explain until you get in there and do it. Yeah, it's one of those things that it really takes a pretty big nudge to get someone to do. We found there's a lot of attachment to our stuff. But once you do it, like many of these practices, and you see the benefit, then it becomes something you're consistently doing. So it's not like you're doing one big clean out a year. It's like you're constantly editing. And also it helps you be, I think, a more thoughtful consumer because you really think like, okay, do I really want this? Do I really need this? Is this something that I'm going to want to hold on to versus something that's going to go in the giveaway pile next month? 
Well, it also comes back to what we talked about earlier, the Jim Carrey quote where, you know, you can have everything and it doesn't really bring happiness. So it's, you know, it's not what people would think. But again, like Jim says, he wishes everybody could have whatever it is they want so they could see it's not not going to bring well-being and happiness. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting, Blake, because at the time when you mentioned how you moved onto the boat around the time that Tom started, obviously at that time, I know it took you a few years before the company became profitable, but when it did and money started really coming in, I'm sure in a way like it hadn't in the past, it could have been tempting for you to start buying things that you dreamed about and collecting different things. But living on a sailboat would have limited, obviously, what you can buy and collect. Yeah, exactly. So it, it was a physical constraint that was probably very uh, beneficial looking back on it. Yeah. And what about movement? How are you moving your body day to day? We mentioned surfing earlier. I'm just curious what your regular exercise routine looks like. We talked about in the beginning, you know, when you fit that in in relation to, you know, not eating breakfast in the morning and depending on what you're doing when you'll exercise. But let's get into the specifics and talk about what you do day in, day out for exercise. Yeah, I found with exercise and movement, the most important factor in people sticking with it is that it's fun. <laughs> you know, so if, if it's kind of like a, a diet, like if you're on a, whatever diet, I mean, there's so many different diets out there and different ones work for different people. But the ones that usually work are the ones that you stick to regardless of what it is. And then the same is with exercise and movement. So it's got to be fun. So for me, most of my exercise is activities. It's going for a mountain bike. It's hiking with my kids. It's going surfing. You know, it's doing a yoga class. Uh, it's all things that I really like look forward to doing. Now, at the same time, I recognize that for longevity and you know, strength is very important and specifically just like, you know, how your body is, um, I don't know if the right word is conditioned. So when I do do weight training, which is maybe two to three times a week, I am really focusing on my posterior chain so that I continue to build those muscles that will give me great posture as I get old, because that's one of the real challenges for people who get old and their health deteriorating is they haven't built their posterior chain enough. We tend to focus on the front of our body so much more with weight training, probably because that's what we can see in the mirror. But the truth is, is the posterior chain is where all the long-term benefits are, at least from the people that I've worked with. And then also really making sure that I can activate key muscles that protect my bones and joints. So really getting good at activating my glutes really protects my knees and does not allow me to be so quad dominant. That also leads to a lot of knee problems for people. So really learning how to use my glutes and my hamstrings using very specific exercises. So I'm not in the gym like pumping a ton of weight, but I'm being very, very precise with the movement so that I'm building that posterior chain in a really thoughtful way and getting muscles to fire in a way that protects my joints and my ligaments. And what hobbies are you spending a lot of your time doing these days? You know, I mean, it really depends on the season. In the summer, it's a lot of mountain climbing and we have a, a wake surf boat. We surf behind the boat, which is really fun, uh, just down the road from our house. And then, you know, when I'm not in the mountains and I'm on vacations, it's usually always a surfing vacation. That's my biggest love. Where's your favorite place to surf? Oh man, that's such a hard question because each place is unique and special for its own way. I, I think probably some of the best uh, surfing I've ever had has been in the Maldives. Okay, nice. And how much do you think finding your passion and following that passion plays into health and well-being? You're obviously somebody that is super passionate, hardworking, and, and you keep finding these things that bring joy in that realm through Tom's and now through Made For. But is this tied into one of the months for Made For to find, whether it be through your career or even through hobbies, finding a passion and putting emphasis into that? Yeah, I think passion is a great word, um, but I also think it can be very confusing because it can mean so many things to so many people. I think more specifically, it's important to really know kind of what's your North Star in life, like what's your, your personal mission statement? You know, I know in all the companies I've started, we've always had a corporate mission statement that we've all aligned around. So I think it's really important to really work to really define your personal mission statement and then really your core values. Like, you know, how are you going to make decisions in your life? What's the culture of your family going to be? What's your personal kind of brand identity or culture that all ties into this idea of what you're made for. And yes, we definitely get into all of that in the program. And for you specifically, personally, over the years, how much has, you know, following your passion led to well-being and happiness? Quite a bit, especially with, you know, the, the activities that I'm passionate with about, 
you know, the passion to help others, to use business to improve lives. I've really been uh, incredibly lucky in that I've really been able to integrate my passions into pretty much everything I do in my life. So another one of the months for Made For is breath. And this is something that I personally actually do before I interview. I do a breathing protocol. I have this app, XBT Life, on my phone, and I go through this midday energizer. It's actually an app that's associated with Laird Hamilton and Gabby Reese, who are previous guests on the show as well. I just find that doing this, this intentional breathing and going through this exercise just brings me this mental clarity and truly does energize me. So I'm just curious how you've played around with breathing over the years and, and what that's done for you. Yeah, I know. I know that app and I've actually attended one of the XBT weekends. And I think what Laird and they're doing is amazing. You know, I think breath is like you already stated, it can do, it can calm you, it can energize you. I mean, there's so many different ways to use your breath. And we get into a lot of that in that made for month, because I think that, you know, we look to outside stimulants outside of ourselves to regulate ourselves. And you can do it a lot with internally with your breath. And that's a really powerful thing. Once you learn that and also understand the science of why it works in terms of calming your nervous system or giving you energy. I really didn't do much breath work until I started down this path of building the Made For program and met, you know, just, you know, research study after research study showing how important breath is in preparing for, you know, a challenging conversation or getting ready for a big interview or just waking up in the morning and kind of getting your oxygen flowing through your body. So breath is a really important thing. It's also very nuanced. And that's why we spend a whole month with teaching you different protocols and, and different tools that you can use based on your need of the day. Have you ever experimented with the Wim Hoth breathing techniques? I have. I spent a day with Wim about three years ago. He was in Los Angeles and a friend of mine invited me over to his place. And that's also got me into doing a lot of cold plunging, which I do regularly now. I love it. Wim's techniques are really amazing to get into a very specific state. It's not something that I would do regularly for me. I think it's a pretty intense on the nervous system but definitely can be used, you know, for the right times. And with all these different things we're talking about, and this is an ongoing challenge I've even experienced over the years, you learn so much in the health and wellness space, and maybe you get inspired about something, it could be anything, intermittent fasting or applying, you know, blue light blocking before sleep, or we could go on and on, any type of health and wellness protocol. But once we make that a habit and we keep adding these things in, how do we make it ongoing? rather than just being like a quick spark and getting inspired and applying it, how do we make sure that we're applying that over the long term? Well, I mean, you really just hit on the nail on the head on the whole, one of the key cornerstones of Made For, and that is scientifically, you found it's very, very hard to learn a new habit and practice and most importantly, sustain it, which you're asking about, unless you do it for 30 days and unless you only focus on that for 30 days. So if you're trying to learn multiple things at a time, like if you're listening to this podcast, like, oh man, that's a ton of great information. I'm going to try to do all those things. It won't work. You really need a lot of intention. You need accountability, which we provide through the Made For program. And you really need to focus on one thing for a 30-day period. Having said that, our goal is not to necessarily teach someone 10 new habits and have them do all of them every day. Some of them are, you know, kind of experiences you might do once a year uh, that reset you or declutter your environment or whatnot. But what we're really helping you do is see how you can move from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset through the adoption and the sustaining of these habits. And what I find with our graduates is there's usually three or four that were so beneficial, so transformative, that they'll be ingrained as habits probably for the rest of their life. I know that was the case for me. And then the other ones are things that they go back to based on different life situations. And for you specifically, what were the ones that became ingrained? Definitely sleep, hydration, connection, and gratitude. Those are four of the big ones for me. All right, Blake, really enjoyed the conversation, but I have one final question for you. What does ultimate health mean to you? Ultimate health to me really is freedom. So if you think about this idea that being in a state where you feel free and you're not um, a slave to bad habits or compulsions or achy bones or body or uh, a monkey mind. I mean, all these things, mental, physical, spiritual, you know, when you get these right and you have your ultimate health, I think you're ultimately free. And it's an ongoing evolution and ongoing learning and application. And 
something we're all having to constantly work at. Absolutely. All right, Blake, really appreciate the conversation. How can the listeners connect with you after the show? Our website is getmadefor.com, G-E-T-M-A-D-E-F-O-R.com. And then you can follow me on Instagram at at Blake Mikoski. All right. We're going to link it all up in the show notes over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. And thanks so much, Blake. Okay. Have a great day. You too. I really enjoyed that conversation with Blake and I hope you did too. And I'd love to hear what you thought of it over on Instagram. So be sure and tag at Blake Mikoski and at Ultimate Health Podcast. And you can take a screenshot of the player as you're listening or take a short video of yourself or a picture of yourself. And let us know what you took away from the episode. We'd love to connect with you over there. For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 363. We have links there to everything we discussed today, additional show highlights. Be sure and check that out. And before we let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jace Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, you always do such a great job putting the show together. Thank you so much. And this week's fun fact is that for the last couple of weeks, we've been taking out food on Friday evenings and taking it down to the waterfront for a picnic as a family. We're going to try and make this our new weekly ritual during the warmer months. Have an awesome week. Talk soon. Wishing you ultimate health.